from Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 227, recorded on January 12, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent, and everyone else. Well, it's now dark out, and there are no raindrops on the windows that I can see yet, but there will be some. Also joining us from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. From Glasgow, Scotland, Christina Naula. Evening, everybody. Here it's dark and a bit dreary, but, you know, good. We have a guest today who uh, contributed the clinical case from last time. He's here to help us solve it from the wonderful state of Colorado, Jim Small. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm actually in the horrible position of having to be in La Jolla, California, <laughs> uh, fixing my my mother's condo up. Uh, it is 61F16C um, in La Jolla outside. In Colorado, on the other hand, it's supposed to be 12 below zero F in the next couple of days, <laughs> which I, I think I'm going to cancel my Southwest flight and tell my wife, Carry on, dear. Um, <laughs> here's how to run the snowblower. That's right. All right. All La, right La, Jolla, did, did. La Jolla has a special uh, spot in my heart. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's where I, so I had a cousin and growing up, we were very close. He moved to California. So I would go out and visit, actually I'd go to school out there and um, I learned to surf and nearly drowned in La Jolla. Mm. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, we're glad you didn't well. because uh, here you are on TWIP, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's right. <laughs> and I still don't know what I'm doing on the surfboard. Um, so actually, the case study from TWIP 225, uh, for those those tuning in for the first time, those tuning back in, uh, Dr. Jim Small, take it away. This is the case of a 41-year-old male mechanical engineer. He's a former Army Ranger trainee. He moved from Denver, where he had an engineering job, along with um, some other family, to Chattanooga, Tennessee a few years back. He was in his usual state of what I would call vigorous health, hiking. He runs Spartan races through the mud. He was working on his semi-rural property, uh, commuting to his place of work daily. About three months previous to his diagnosis, he began having episodes of sudden GI distress with diarrhea, often in the evening, followed by itchy hives in the axilla and groin, uh, which he would treat with Benadryl and got some relief. One evening, though, at 10, about 10 at night, he had another episode, again took Benadryl, but he began to experience gradual onset, but relentlessly increasing shortness of breath and wheezing. He was taken at high speed to the local emergency room by his wife. Interestingly, he reported that a relaxation exercise with a repetitive meditative prayer seemed to control the symptoms, but he said it felt like his throat was closing. Past history includes variable exercise and cold-induced asthma, uh, treated him with an inhaler, mostly as a child, occasional episodes in adulthood um, related to high exposure to cat dander. Family history, not contributory. Diet was basically omnivorous. They had one dog, a labradoodle named Raphael, which they chose because he was, quote, hypoallergenic. In the emergency department, he was treated with bronchodilators, intramuscular epinephrine, and antihistamines, and the symptoms got better. The ED physician was experienced, as was his primary care doc, and they ordered a diagnostic test, having seen other similar cases in the region. A lifestyle intervention was successful. All right. We had a number of listener guesses here on this one, quite a few, more than 
recent. So now we'll we'll we will have um, our voice artist Karen read those for you. James writes, "Hello, all Twippers. I believe I wrote about this in a couple of Substack posts. Likely looking at AGS, Alpha Gal syndrome. Both have been addressed in MMWR and a HAN alert." This is spreading with the effect of climate change. Updates on previous posts and coffee. James. Hawken writes, Hello. This week was sure a thinker. Not sure I got there, but given the Spartan case hints and the active outdoors work and urticaria and asthma, the only thing I could come up with that had all the symptoms in one would be a strongaloides infection. Seemed like giardia and being allergic to even small amounts of dog dander would potentially do it as well. Best wishes this holiday season. Hawken. Mikhail writes, Dear Twip Team, As I write this, here in Knoxville, Tennessee, it is a gloomy and rainy Christmas day. I'm lucky enough to be working a split shift at the veterinary hospital, so I have a relatively sizable break to rest and reply to this episode's case. I spent a good few hours pondering this case. I thought that my veterinary background would aid me in this case, but I think I overestimated the degree to which it was helpful. In the case of the man with sudden diarrhea and presumably anaphylactic reaction, I originally thought the diarrhea was a red herring, as if there was involvement of an endoparasite, it would warrant treatment beyond a simple change in lifestyle. Continuing down that line of thinking, the cause of this man's anaphylaxis may have been caused by an allergic reaction from the bites of fleas and or other mites that he could have acquired from his hypoallergenic dog. For those unaware, there is sadly no such things as human allergy is usually caused by dog dander, not the shedding of fur. If it were a mite infection, a change of lifestyle could be a potential treatment, but there's no mention of profuse skin lesions aside from hives or treatment of the man's environment, which would be warranted if there was some kind of flea or mite infestation. Thinking of other canine ectoparasites, and after discussing the case with a friend, I remembered how a specific parasite can lead to the development of an allergy. This would explain the diarrhea, anaphylaxis, lack of antiparasitic treatment, mention of the specific region, and Dr. Griffin's question about the patient's diet. I believe this man has a case of alpha-gal syndrome, which leads to an allergy to red meat. He must have acquired this after being bitten by Amblyoma amerinacum, the Lone Star Tick, which he may have picked up either from his dog or on one of his hikes through the Tennessee wilderness. As long as he avoids eating red meat, he can avoid future anaphylactic episodes. And I would also verify that his dog is on flea and tick preventatives in case that is how he acquired the tick. Thank you for another great case. I hope I will be in the running for a textbook. Sincerely, Mikhail. Inga writes... Warm greetings from the cool and wet north of the Netherlands, where we are experiencing a wet and windy tailstorm of Garrett passing over the UK with a typical 11 degrees Celsius. To my disappointment, I noticed I was a mere one day late with my response to the previous case. I've pushed my research for the next case more to the front, hoping to be on time for this case, which was quite the challenge. I hope to have a thought somewhat in the right direction and take part in the chance for winning a book. The case of a 41-year-old man from Tennessee with episodes of GI distress with diarrhea and complaints of urticaria, shortness of breath, and wheezing with ultimately what appears to be an anaphylaxis-like symptoms. After researching these complaints, it seems that there are quite a number of parasites that could cause both GI and allergic complaints. Among those that may appear in the U.S. and are more likely in semi-rural communities, the ones that jump most to the front for me are echinococcus, both granulosis and multilocaris, ascaris lumbricoides, and strongyloides stercoralis. Echinococcus could cause GI complaints when assist ruptures with fluid irritating the peritoneal cavity, and its rupture leading to allergic reactions. Ascaris is known to both cause GI complaints and Loeffler syndrome with asthmatic complaints and bronchial hyperreactivity and can lead to anaphylaxis during worm migration. Strongyloides is known to cause GI complaints and can cause pulmonary complaints, amongst which are bronchial hyperreactivity and urticaria. However, there are more parasites that should be thought of, including Toxicara and the hookworms. As for the experienced ED physician recognizing these complaints from similar cases, I commend him. But I'm not as experienced in which of these or other pathologies could be more likely here. 
I would therefore recommend broad diagnostic tests, at least including a stool exam, preferably high volume with sedimentation, as to increase the likelihood of catching strongyloides if present, as well as serodiagnosis for echinococcus. Imaging studies could be done as well for echinococcus, in which case I would start with ultrasound of the liver, but wait with further imaging studies until serodiagnosis is returned, or unless the patient's complaints continue to progress. In that case, a more speedy tract may be necessary. In that case, a CT would be recommended. If cysts are seen, surgical evaluation may be necessary, but oral treatment with albendazole is recommended. In the case of no cysts, it could be opted to treat with ivermectin for strongyloides and albendazole for ascaris, where albendazole may have some added benefit for treating strongyloides as well. Kind regards and many well wishes for the upcoming New Year's. Inga. Christian writes... Dear TWIT team, greetings from Rainy Basil. I think that the recurring and intensifying allergic reactions of the patient, in addition to the geography and his outdoor activities, makes it very likely that this is a case of alpha-gal syndrome. AGS is an incredibly interesting problem, as it is caused by the saliva of the lone star tick, with some other species potentially being able to cause it too. However, AGS is particularly intriguing as it is thought that we as a species, apes and old world monkeys, have lost the ability to produce galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, alpha-gal, due to evolutionary pressures of millions of years ago in our common ancestor. Therefore, now the immune system recognizes it as foreign, also a problem involving xenotransplants of organs. There are even more peculiar factoids to it, such as AGS being a delayed food allergy and an allergy against a carbohydrate and not a protein. For this patient, it would therefore be important to avoid any meat of mammals to prevent further allergic reactions, and with a bit of luck, he will be able to eat meat again in not-so-distant future. Best wishes, Christian. Jay writes, Dear Twip Team, this 41-year-old man's symptoms, along with his improvement after a lifestyle intervention, are consistent with the alpha-gal syndrome. It's often helpful to cast a wide net when developing a differential diagnosis, even when we suspect there is an infectious or more specifically parasitic cause to a condition, we should consider non-infectious causes as well. There were some strong clues that led to this diagnosis. He has allergies, so much so that he chose a hypoallergenic dog, Raphael, his current symptoms began after moving to Chattanooga, a part of the country where the Lone Star Tick is common. His severe symptoms improved with bronchodilators, intramuscular epinephrine, and antihistamines. The clincher is that the ED physician ordered a diagnostic test and the man's symptoms abated with a lifestyle intervention. I suspect the diagnostic test was an alpha-gal IgE panel and the lifestyle intervention consisted of a change in diet, avoidance of mammalian meat and dairy products. It was also likely recommended that he keep an EpiPen and antihistamines on hand and that he does what he can to avoid further tick bites. Alpha-gal syndrome is an allergy to a carbohydrate, galactose A13 galactose, a.k.a. alpha-gal. Alpha-gal is found in all non-primate mammals. Alpha-gal is also found in the saliva of the lone star tick. When a lone star tick bites, it passes alpha-gal on through its saliva. For someone with AGS, this exposure to alpha-gal eventually leads to immune sensitization. The immune system becomes hypersensitive to alpha-gal and, as a result, exposure to small amounts of it, such as the mammalian meat this omnivorous man ate, leads to an allergic reaction two to six hours after ingestion. The syndrome does not occur when eating non-mammalian meats such as chicken and fish. He can continue to be an omnivore, just a more selective one. AGS also occurs worldwide. In the U.S., the bite of the Lone Star tick leads to this immune sensitization. Alpha-gal is found in other tick species elsewhere in the world. This case is a good reminder to cast a wide net when developing one's differential diagnosis. Thank you. Keep up your great work. Jay. Rafid writes, Hello, TWIP team. Greetings from the wintry Quebec. I would like to take a moment to thank the TWIP team, and Vincent in particular, for sending me the parasitology book which I received on Christmas Eve in the mail. I have been thoroughly enjoying this book. It is detailed and at the same time to the point written in a simple and clear language. It is a rare gift to be able to express complex information in such a readable way. It will definitely be a cherished part of my library for years to come. I also really appreciate that it is signed. 
I cannot thank you enough. Back to the case at hand. Our hospitals are still full of the unvaccinated masses suffering respiratory, cardiac, and other complications of respiratory viruses, so I've been pretty busy lately, so I will not be able to give a broad differential diagnosis for this challenging case that I admit has left me stumped. If I had to make a quick guess as to a dog owner who lives in a hot climate and tends to his rural plot of land and develops intermittent urticaria, GI, and respiratory symptoms— I would say that Toxicaria canis infection would definitely be possible. I did read the excellent chapter 27 on aberrant nematode infections in my new personally signed book on parasitic diseases. And although many zoonotic nematodes can cause urticaria, most are quite rare. T. canis seems to be the most likely culprit in this case. Looking forward to hearing the answer. Rafid. First Vienna Parasitology Passion Club writes... Dear Alpha Gals and Alpha Guys, The case presented is consistent with Alpha Gal Syndrome, a kind of allergy to mammalian meat. While we would usually give some information about epidemiology, pathophysiology, diagnosis, and treatment of the disease, we feel that is not necessary at this time. Just a few days ago, our very own Michelle Negley published an article on the AMS website, which can be found here. It outlines everything the casual listener should know about the syndrome, so we shall leave you with that. However, it is interesting to note that there is, as of now, no consensus within our club on whether or not people being unable to eat mammalian meat is actually a bad thing. Thank you for this great case. All the best, Michelle and Alexander from the First Vienna Parasitology Passion Club. P.S. The voice artist is really doing a fantastic job especially concerning the difficult pronunciations. However, we both miss the character that your own readings lend to the letters, including your quips, comments, and tangents. Michelle and Alex. Felix writes, Dear hosts, I'm unsure at this time, but some research brought up parasitic nematodes called anisakis, which then causes allergic reactions. The dog doesn't really fit the picture, and there was no mentioning of raw fish consumption, but the symptoms, on the other hand, fit really well. The lifestyle intervention mentioned would be to skip the tasty sushi, which is quite a tough one. Props to the ED physician for getting that one right. Greetings, Felix. Leon writes, Hello, dear TWIP team. The 41-year-old male from the U.S. experiencing GI distress, itchy hives, and trouble breathing— likely suffers from an infection with Strongyloides stercoralis. Infection usually occurs by coming into contact with soil containing the infectious filariform larvae of this nematode. The larvae penetrate the skin, enter subcutaneous lymphatic vessels, and travel to the lungs. Parasites that reach the tracheobronchial tree are coughed up and swallowed, ultimately ending up in the small intestines where they complete their life cycle to be either passed out into the outside world or reinfect the host. The itchy rash aligns with symptoms caused by the entry of the larva into the skin. Diarrhea is a consequence of the parasite residing in the GI tract, and shortness of breath corresponds to its presence in the lungs, causing irritation as the larvae migrate. This may be exacerbated by his asthma. I have very limited medical knowledge, but could the intake of Benadryl may have caused the sudden exacerbation of the respiratory problems? He likely contracted the infection through contact with contaminated soil during his various outdoor activities. Alternatively, he could have obtained the infection from getting in contact with feces of his dog, which could be infected as well. The disease can be easily diagnosed with an antibody test or microscope analysis. Ivermectin would be the first line of treatment. To prevent future infections, the individual should wear shoes when walking on soil, avoid contact with fecal material, such as that of his dog, and wash his hands regularly. Testing and treating the dog may also be considered to exclude this potential source of infection. On a side note... While backpacking through Guatemala and South Mexico this summer, I was surprised that within seven weeks of traveling, hardly any locals I spoke to know about Chagas or Leishmania. Is this normal? Only the doctors in Antigua and the hospital were aware of it. While suffering from a severe case of Montezuma's revenge, unfortunately, it turned out to be a bacterial infection. I was already excited to share my case with you. Is there really such a lack of public awareness of these diseases? 
I hope this time I have a correct answer since the last time I failed to do so and finally get a book. Greetings from the smaller and older York in England. Leon. Justin writes, Hello all. It has been a while since I last guessed, and I thought I should take a shot at this one. The location of Tennessee and the semi-rural living conditions made me think of hookworm. The GI distress and the rash fit well for hookworm, and respiratory problems can also be seen in the hookworm cases. I am puzzled that the only treatment was a lifestyle intervention and no medication. But if a lifestyle intervention was suggested for a hookworm patient, I would guess it involves fecal sanitation and wearing shoes outdoors, as hookworms are a soil-transmitted helminth. Therefore, my guess would be one of the hookworms. Thanks for the lovely podcast, Justin. Um, all right, so those were those were our case guesses. Um, Daniel, anything else we should uh, know about? Um. You know, I, th I think before we start guessing, um, hopefully everyone here got a chance to, uh, you know, and everyone here, including our listeners at home or out on the road or wherever you might be listening from. Um, but I don't know if, uh, if Dixon, Vincent, Vincent, if you had any, you know, after maybe listening to those uh those guesses. If you had any other questions, I mean, I, I had a, I have a few questions because I'm still, I'm still at a differential level. I still would like the results of a <laughs> diagnostic test and also a couple more history items. But um, uh, Dixon, should we start with you? Did you have any questions that you wanted to throw? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, it's obvious that there's some hyperallergic response going on that can be um, addressed with anti-inflammatories. Uh, but those are addressing symptoms, not causation. So my all of my questions relates to the cause of this um, allergic response that the patient is exhibiting. And, um, you know, I want to know more about whether you're still on a labradoodle, uh, whether you maybe got 10 labradoodles to sort of overwhelm <laughs> the system and make sure that it never comes back because you can you can do that sometimes with um, injections of that antigen as to whatever you're allergic to. Uh, but I think if they did patch tests and put in enough different organisms, I would like to know the results of that. So Dixon wanted a bunch of want the patch testing stuff, but he's not going to get that. Um, Christina, did you did you have any tests or any any history? I would say the cheapest test is a little more history. Um, yeah, so what I really wanted was a better Google search engine. <laughs> 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 I did. I did think about that case and I just thought about it and thought about it. And I don't know, things are falling in place after listening to, to the guesses, but I did not myself come to a conclusion um, because I, I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't figure out how to connect the diarrhea with the increasingly more severe allergic reaction. Um, so I, I, I have to admit, I did. I had to, I had to admit defeat essentially. So, um, and I couldn't even think of any intelligent questions either. All right. Well, I'll. I mean, maybe I'll do my my thinking out loud, and then Vincent yeah. might want to jump in. So, yeah. So the the first thing I go through this case, and I'm trying to understand. Well, what exactly is is the person presenting with? And yeah, I think everyone has sort of mentioned it. it it's an allergic, right? A, kind of an anaphylactic. You know, the the feeling like his his throat is closing. Um, so it's you know here's here's this 41 year old who for much of his life was relatively healthy. It sounds like vigorously healthy, other than this asthma issues, um, but now seems to be having some kind of um, some sort of exposure probably that is triggering a pretty significant inflammatory, almost anaphylactic, um, pretty close to anaphylactic reaction here. Um, I, I'm thinking they thought it was an anaphylaxis by the time you know intramuscular epinephrine and histamines, bronchodilators. Um, and so, you know, in our world of this week in parasitism, um, what things can, can trigger that? Are there any exposures, any, um, any things that might be injected into the body that can trigger that? So I start thinking about, um, you know, tick exposures, by the way, and we'll, we'll kind of go farther. Um, but then other things that, and things that we did and didn't get, right? So, you know, one of the first things and some of our emailers threw this in is, could this be something like, like strongaloides? And, and we're seeing that, that eosinophilia, and, but, but we never hear about that. We hear about a blood test, and I don't think it's a CBC with a, with a differential. Um, 
I would love to ask some questions about. So, so tell me a little bit more about your diet and are there certain things in your diet um, that might be associated with, with a triggering um, and some of those things in the diet that I might think about is the consumption of, of dead mammals, um, <laughs> you know, and any particular dead mammals that might uh, trigger a response. You know, we mentioned he's omnivorous, but, you know, does he start off with oatmeal and then, you know, maybe a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch? And then maybe he has a steak for dinner. And oh my gosh, right after that is when things might get triggered. So um, I would be a little bit more curious if I can't sort out a little bit um, more about um, what might be going on dietary wise and maybe there's something that's associated with this. So um, yeah, I too would order that one blood test, which I think would be confirmatory. Um, but before we talk about, I guess, what blood test I would order and what might've been ordered, Vincent, do you sort of see where I'm going with this? Yeah, I, I, look, this is this week in parasitism, okay? If, <laughs> if our guest gave us a non-parasite case, he's never coming back on the show again. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming so some of the listeners as you heard guessed uh, um, you know alpha gal syndrome which is very appealing because that could involve a lifestyle intervention right but I'm thinking this is a parasite and I cannot I don't without any diagnostic tests I can't figure out what it is because I'm not a parasitologist so um, I, 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 I don't know yeah. Can I uh, jump back in and change my uh, <laughs> view a yeah. little bit? Have we, have we focused it enough? <laughs> no, I can you offer some <laughs> more. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm, when you think about um, this kind of an aller allergic response, and it has to be a parasite of some sort, mm -hmm. uh, which I think it does, uh, then, you know, ec ectoparasites and uh, particularly mites, uh, dust mites, something small, something innocuous, something that, you know, everybody has around their home, but uh, there are concentrations of mites uh, that accumulate along the windowsills because birds land there and lots of other uh, situations where mites might play into this. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe something along those lines, but uh, again, a blood test is, uh, they didn't do any examination of your house. They didn't ransack it. Empty refrigerator, you know, and, uh, look for hidden pets in the basement and, you know, Sweeney Todd like behavior out in the backyard. Um, so you, you're. Hmm. I did consider uh, ectoparasites, but I wasn't sure how I could how I could bind in the diarrhea. So. Um, well. Yeah. yeah I, are there any, it may are there not any fit. I mean, parasites these, you can think about that might bite you, that might inject that something might. into you that would trigger yeah, some kind of a, uh, a new allergy that maybe you didn't have before, maybe induce some sort of an IgE mm -hmm. response? You know, I don't know the answer, so I could be like barking up a tree and steering people <laughs> wrong. I sure yeah, hope no not. <laughs> You know, ha, you know, trigger mites, for instance, are, are seasonal. They come with mowing lawns and things like this, and they, they attack around the belt, and they have little bite marks that are quite easy to discern once you've decided what to look for. Um, my, my laboratory, when I was at Columbia, was just down the hall from the Department of Dermatology, so I heard a lot of these, um, you know, really weird uh, allergic conditions, one of which was a woman had gone off on her honeymoon and bought a brand new bathing suit. And uh, she came back and all of her allergic response was, was uh, looked like she was wearing a bathing suit, except that she wasn't. Uh, she was absolutely broken out wherever this bathing suit made contact with her skin. So she had contact allergy and it turned out to be a new dye that they were using in a Jensen ba mm -hmm. bathing suit. They actually traced it back to the factory. And she was, uh, you know, exonerated and perhaps uh, remunerated for her sufferings, uh, which spoiled the hell out of her honeymoon, as you can imagine. But this doesn't sound anything like that. <laughs> mm. Well, It has to be something right. that can be also triggered by eating. Yeah, so well, maybe, maybe yeah. James... Uh, Jim can shed some light on this uh, for us. Yeah, did you want well, to answer is... any of my questions before I go out on a limb and, and <laughs> order the uh, the Alpha Gal IgE test? <laughs> <laughs> well, the the omnivorous diet uh, included 
often oatmeal in the morning. It often included uh, sandwiches at lunch. It often included um, expired mammal meat at night. Um, milk, milk products <laughs> aged, often aged. aged. Yeah, at least a few hours, and um, uh, and um, it was uh, the problem was the symptoms came on several hours after eating. So linking them was is challenging. Um, I, uh, um, what else did you, uh, were you asking about? Um, lots of outdoor exposure to every biting arthropod under the sun in mm -hmm. Chattanooga, of course. Um, and, uh, so that's, that's common. Um, uh, the dog passed away a few years ago from interestingly prostate cancer. Mm. Uh, which in dogs can be a forest fire. It can be a terrible disease. Um, uh, it usually isn't in old dudes like me, but but in dogs it can be a real mess. And uh, and it was for poor Raffi. So, mm. um, what what other questions? You know, I had one that I sort of came and went. You know, I was considering, okay, maybe he's, you know, in and out of the water, this triathlon. Maybe there's some mm. sort of like a, you know, avian schisto and he, every time he goes. But it, it you know, I sort of came and went with that, um, you know, just yeah. sort of thinking in my differential of other things that he might have developed some sort of a sensitivity to. Um, but no, I, I feel like I've gotten test, right? most of my, uh, yeah, most of my, I'm, I'm ready to order my lab test. And now, Jay, Jim, uh, I think the solution to this might be maybe you could bring the patient in on, and have him talk yeah. to us. So, uh, so Chris, tell us about <laughs> what this was like to live with this when, especially that horrible night when Sarah. Uh, by the way, um, Chris is my son-in-law, so <laughs> um, I, I know him well, and uh, he kept me posted on all this. Um, so what was it like um, for you trying to figure out what the heck was going on? Um, as you said, with the diet, there is a delay in the um, symptoms. So that made it a little bit tricky to connect one with the other. And the night that I went to the emergency room and subsequently got the blood test, um, was a particularly bad response. <clears throat> um, it started coming on with hives and some intestinal distress. And those hives ended up taking about 80% of my body was covered in hives. And my ears were swelled out to the outside. Um, I tried taking a shower to calm things down, taking some Benadryl. And it really was getting painful to move. I couldn't lie down or anything. Um, so we decided to go to, to the hospital. As we were driving to the hospital, I could feel my throat closing up and was having trouble breathing. So when we got to the hospital, um, as soon as I got it back to the emergency room, I started to vomit. And uh, the emergency physician at the time, he was coming off shift, he looked at the symptoms and he said, give him a blood test and then walked away. So it was prevalent in this area. Um, my wife also suspected she was starting to make the connection with dietary because I had had um, similar symptoms that at the time we attributed to sleeping with a wool blanket. <laughs> so we had had uh, fried some steak over campfire and had some s'mores and um, then went to bed and I woke up with these hives and we attributed that to the wool blanket. And that was probably about a month before this last incident. Uh, usually at that time, my breakfast was delicious. It consisted of uh, bacon. Wow. With eggs fried in the bacon fat. <laughs> and, Nothing uh, like that, it. That didn't, man, that's, that's as good as it gets right there. So, any other questions for my uh, my son-in-law here, who is now functioning well? Um, as you might imagine, uh, with celiac in some family members, some vegetarians, some omnivores, et cetera, et cetera, Christmas and Thanksgiving at my house, my wife 
pulls her hair out and then gets to work on on figuring out a diet for all of us. So any other questions for Chris? Yeah, uh, just one, and that is the recommendation that they made after the blood test came back was that uh, <laughs> I'm going to guess diet in this case. I don't know why, but I'm, I'm just going to say it. What is it? Was it a single item that you eliminated from your life and, and what you had never came back? I mean, I'm sort of yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe a, si- a single class of items. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I'm driving out. A single dr- a class of items yes, that you, you couldn't yes, connect the dots now, with. Are you now a vegan? <laughs> <laughs> or strictly a meat eater. <laughs> no, I, I am not a vegan and I'm not strictly a meat eater. Did you He's did still you, an uh, omnivore, but a more complex subclass of omnivore. Mm-hmm. Did, did you get rid uh-huh. of like milk products? I don't do milk products anymore. Ah. Uh-huh. There you go. This is not parasite. <laughs> no, I, I think I, well, oh. I, you know, I guess I'll be curious in a second, right? Is so, okay. yeah. yeah. So, so my suspicion, like many of our emailers after this, um, you know, was that this was actually the result of a lone star tick bite, and that you had developed uh, the alpha gal sensitivity, mm-hmm. um, and the blood test that I would have, you know, because if we were thinking like, oh, he's now lactose intolerant, or now has a, you know, it's not really a blood test, right? It's like here, drink a glass of skim milk, and you're going to like buckle over, and your belly's going to hurt. But you're not, you know, it's very rare to people actually have a, a anaphylactic reaction to lactose. Um, the other Don't thing, start. which is, you know, we'll find out as I bark up this tree, is that um, developing an alpha gal sensitivity um, is not necessarily making you um, allergic, doesn't necessarily give you an IgE response to all mammalian products, right? So some people with an alpha gal, um, they just need to avoid beef or some of them just need to avoid the milk products. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like some of them can, can eat pork, some can eat beef, but it's just, so within the alpha gal um, reactivity, um, there are certain of these mammalian products that are triggers and not everyone. So um, even though we might initially start with the, um, with the alpha-gal IgE, you can actually do like a meat panel um, we mm-hmm. can figure out which of the, you know, sort of more sophisticated, like which dietary things do you need to avoid or not? Um, if I'm actually going in the right direction here. All right. Well, I think it's time to uh, <clears throat> get a reveal on this, don't you think? Yes. So the diagnostic test was an IgE for yeah. alpha gal, and it was very high. And the lifestyle intervention was elimination of all mammal products. Um, really? It turns out that there is a slight exception. Uh, you can eat other great apes, uh, which also lack the alpha gal. Which, mm. hey, I'm a pathologist at a medical school. Actually, God, cannib- hey. cannibalism <laughs> is perfectly acceptable. Yeah, you know. cannibalism would would not <laughs> elicit the alpha gal response. Yeah, I, I um, haven't eaten any humans. Bush meat? You could have bush meat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chris hasn't. Uh, there's not that many. Uh, great apes in the wild, even in the wild animal parks in Texas. I don't, I've never heard of ape hunting in Texas. Um, but um, yeah, that would be a little weird. Um, but yeah, that was the, um, uh, and it's thought to be usually a lone star tick bite, but it's, there's such a gap between the the bite and the and the development of the hypersensitivity that it's difficult to really really um, establish a causality. There are papers about mosquito bites because some mosquitoes have some alpha gal and and chiggers, which I think were all already mentioned. And mm-hmm. there are scads of chiggers chiggers in Tennessee also. Um, uh, the alpha gal. It's interesting in light of your last. Um, a uh, TWIP session where you were talking about the malaria, glyc- was it malaria? No, it was the, the, the cow worm uh, glycoprotein uh, where the, the glyco part of the glycoprotein was the key mm-hmm. antigen 
uh, alpha gal is two oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah two galactose uh, rings hooked together in an alpha one three linkage. Galactose is is just an isomer of glucose. It's almost the same molecule as glucose. So it's a it's a two galactose linked um, glycoprotein, which is present in most mammals, but not in fish or fowl or reptiles. Not a lot of reptile eating going on. So Chris has has done vegan fish and um, and a lot of chicken and turkey. Um, do you have anything else to add, Chris, about what your experience was? No, not that I not that I can think of. Is I mean, you've had a couple of recurrences from being being faked out by something, right? Yes, usually I know I shouldn't be eating it if I have a thought like, "Oh, this is delicious." Um, <laughs> so, uh, like a breakfast burrito that had sausage in it I took a few bites and it's like wow this is really good I should do this again wait a second or uh, yeah, a turkey burger that was just too good to be true and that was actually not true it was beef so um, things like that uh, butter is okay because it's mainly fat um, and small amounts of milk like that's in chocolate, I can seem to get away with. But if I were to do a lot of chocolate, it would probably get me too. Yeah, yeah so Chris Chris just has a, a regimen of what? Benadryl, loratadine, and one of the uh, H2 blockers like famotidine or something like that. Um, and, and the combination is, is pretty good. Interestingly, that's exactly the same combination I was told to take before my allergy injections for grass pollen mm. allergies, um, wow. the uh, and uh, I had a because I'm a doctor and was stupid. I had an anaphylactic reaction to a, <laughs> a allergy injection because I knew better than they did, and I went out and exercised really hard, and then went in and got the shot, and mm. I got oh. the axillary hives just like Chris did. Mm. And so it's, I don't know why the axilla is such a um, sensitive area for hives to start out, but, but I've heard that over and over. It's just a, a curiosity for me. Um, and uh, the other thing that was really interesting was, this was what, five years ago, Chris-ish? Um, I went around to fellow docs in the Denver area and laid out the symptoms and only one doc in Denver came up with the answer, and that was my allergist. Um, ah. And these were smart internists and family medicine primary care docs. None of them came up with alpha-gal. Um, so that's why I presented this case. Is it a parasite? Yeah, it's an anaphylactic reaction to a product injected in the saliva of a tick. Um, but it's a little bit of a, of a poser. To have that turn into GI upset and skin hives. That's so. That's that's why I presented. I just thought it was interesting, and maybe somebody will will be triggered by this. Um, it also occurs in other parts of the world. It's been found in Europe, I think, South Africa. Um, so it's not just a, an American disease, but that's where the the bulk of the cases have been described. Well, I think yeah. we asked. Uh, Chris before if he was a vegan he said no right but he's you are a vegan right well no but you can I eat get fish, fish yeah, and he's, reptiles okay. uh, poultry yeah, yeah poultry he's a pe pesco pollo vegetarian uh, <laughs> got it. I got it all right but no I'm glad I'm glad actually so this is one of those I'm going to say not only underappreciated but it's a growing problem, and thanks to mm -hmm. global warming, it's going to be a growing problem. Um, you know, on, on the ID podcast, we were talking about people that develop heart block, and no one bothers to check them for Lyme disease until after they have a pacer. Mm. And it's because as Lyme spreads outside our region where we know to check for that, um, people just get pacers. And then someone's like, well, what do you mean? They, they have Lyme disease? What's up with that? I could have given them like a week of antibiotics instead of a pacer. And, you know, alpha-gal syndrome is really spreading, right? I mean, the Lone Star Tick um, has spread up into our area, um, you know, and 
it's over 10,000 suspected cases a year of this, and most of them are getting delayed diagnosis, right? Um, because this was kind of classic, right? I mean, a lot of our emailers jumped right on it, right? I mean, a lot of these emailers, they're, they're not even, you know, they're not MDs. They're not even MDs in, a, in an area. Um, but sort of this, this story about, you know, you get this, this galactose alpha-1,3 galactose injected. You develop this IgE response. You keep triggering it. There's this delay from the tick bite. There's this delay from when you eat certain things. Um, it's not always the same reaction to the different products. You know, and a lot of people think, well, you know, meat, um, you know, chicken, turkey, you're probably fine with. Eating other people and great apes, you're probably fine with. Um, <laughs> but it could be well, triggered by it could be triggered by Jello, right? By the gelatin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like where did that come from? And you think mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're eating your your diet where you're protecting yourself. So, I mean, I think this is a great opportunity for awareness, right? For you know, hopefully, people it listening is. to our show mm -hmm. to start thinking about you know sending these people to someone who's going to pick up on this, who's going to do that that diagnostic confirmatory blood test. Sure. Well, all my medical oh, students know about this, obviously, <laughs> and uh, and now all our Twipsters know about this. So this was my little effort at uh, you know my public service announcement, if you like. That's great. And I hope Vincent that this qualifies as a as a parasitic yeah, thing since it's the Absolutely. tick. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I don't want to yeah. be I don't want to be banned from <laughs> no, you're the, good. from Twip. <laughs> you're um, good. You, you wouldn't be. So let me let me add a note on the historical perspective wait, wait, before here. Wait, wait, let me let Chris uh, go, Dixon, because uh, oh, sure, 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 thank absolutely. You. Chris, thank hey, you so much. Good to, thank no, you. Good to see you, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity. Theobald Smith, back in the 1800s, was the first one to demonstrate that a disease could be transmitted by an arthropod. That arthropod was the Lone Star tick. And what was the disease, Dixon? That's a great question. I <laughs> wish you fever. hadn't asked. Cattle <laughs> fever. It was Sorry, cattle it was fever. Monster. It was Texas cattle yeah. fever. Okay. It was a babesiosis. Babesiosis. <laughs> it shipping, a shipping something disease? No, no, no. no that's brucellosis. brucellosis. That's okay. brucellosis. Yeah. But, it was, right. but it was actually the first demonstration of the a first vector one. born, which led to the whole concept that, hey – Maybe mosquitoes can transmit stuff. That's right. Um, that is so yeah, exactly people right. sort of forget the ticks were the first identified uh, arthropor arthropod. I didn't forget. I didn't know that, so thank you. All and right. his, Sorry his I uh, spoiled your interview, no, Vincent, no, no, but no, I just think let you still got the next time. I'm trying to say. <laughs> and his, um, I'm trying to remember the name of his co-author on that investigation. Start with a K. Is this ringing any bells there? Mm, yes, Kilbourne. Kilbourne. Because Kilbourne went along to do a lot of other pretty exciting stuff as well. So I feel How like I could remember it, the name of the organism. Like Kilbourne <laughs> gets all the credit there, but uh, Kilbourne did, uh, you know, did a lot of work there as well as a lot of great work in other areas. They should have both received the Nobel Prize for that also, but they didn't. Yeah, Kilbourne did some stuff in the San Francisco plague outbreak showing the uh, the fleas involved in the transmission. Ah. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we we have to give away a book here. Uh, we have seven. I, I think there are seven eligible individuals. Um, you know, I, I, I'm I'm not good at remembering, but let's do a random number from one to seven. Ready for the drum roll? Number three. <laughs> number three. <laughs> that is. Ingi. Inga, right? Good. Is it I think Inga, Inga is, has not won before. <laughs> so, Inga, uh, you have won. You're in the Netherlands. <laughs> so, please send your address and telephone to twip, T-W-I-P, at microbe.tv, and we will promptly ship you a book. Now, Kim in, in, our, in our offices here is shipping the books out, and uh, so you'll get it. Thank you, Inga. All right. We have no hero today. Oh, let's talk about Dr. Small. Tell us about your career, as far back as you can remember. <laughs> uh, born in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, I, uh, 
uh, went to medical school at Duke and did an MD and a PhD. And I had always found microbiology interesting. I was one of those nerd kids that read books. And uh, I remember rat slice in history, microbe hunters, um, a couple of others, some uh, Louis Pasteur biography. And I got to medical school, did well in micro, which I guess isn't surprising. And then decided to Where do was medical school. Well, Duke. Duke. I was going to say, if Duke, you were Columbia, North Carolina, I might have yeah. taught you microbiology if you were at Columbia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it was, um, uh, I decided to do my PhD in Tom Mitchell's lab at, with, in medical mycology, and where I studied the capsule polysaccharide of Cryptococcus neoformans. So that's, that's a prime example of a PhD knowing more and more about less and less <laughs> until you know everything about nothing. And um, so <laughs> the papers have been cited a few times, whatever. Uh, then I went to residency at the University of Utah. As did I. Oh, did you really? Know that? When were you, when were you at University of Utah? 84 to 87. Okay. So... I um, uh, John Madsen at that time was the chairman of pathology, but he was a pediatric infectious disease guy, actually, who was also a clinical lab guy. And he became the chairman of pathology based on his clinical lab experience. So I figured a PhD in, in microbiology should probably go to where there's a uh, PhD or a uh, infectious disease guy running the department. So... Uh, and I felt, because of some serendipity, I fell into being able to teach mycology as a resident to the second-year medical students. Um, discovered that I really enjoyed giving lectures. And, and the last year, I aced out Dr. Madsen by a hundredth of a point. <laughs> and was the highest was the highest ranked lecturer in the course, which I'm sure is why I was not invited to join the faculty <laughs> at the University of Utah. Um, and then I went in. Uh, I tried for some academic jobs, but pathology in the late '80s was the only medical specialty with a significant unemployment rate. Hmm. It was it was just odd, uh, one of those things. And so I ended up. You know, taking a private job so I could feed my family, which comes ahead of self-actualization, um, and uh, joined some some research groups. I even have a New England Journal paper because of the gynecologic oncology group, which not every private practice pathologist has a New England Journal paper, and uh, uh, worked in a bone marrow transplant hospital um, uh, did, worked in a head and neck cancer hospital. Was all everybody knew that if they had a bug, they brought it to me. By the way, I had a Loa Loa case, um, and the history was woman from the Congo who saw a torpedo swimming in front of her eye. Here's the blood smear. <laughs> um, so that the differential is limited, um, but I found some microfilaria on that. And then I was the second best malaria smear examiner. The first best had spent his military service in Vietnam in Saigon in the hospital looking at malaria smears. So I did not feel bad that he was a little better than I was at that. And then about six years ago, I got a text message from... Uh, a colleague at Rocky Vista University saying, all of a sudden we have a pathology position. Are you interested? And I said, yes, I think I am. And uh, interviewed and I uh, did a sidestep over to um, becoming Professor Small um, as a second career. So that's, that's me. So as a professor, what do you, as a professor of pathology, what do you do? I teach, um, I, I run the medical microbiology course. I often mm -hmm. tell them that I, that was bonus points that I happen to come with this micro hobby. Um, but it's, hard, it's actually not easy to find a microbiologist to teach at a, at a DO school. And by the way, it's a DO school. It's an osteopathic medical school, um, which is, has been interesting. The, 
Uh, DO and MD, as far as state licensure are equivalent degrees, a lot of people don't understand that. Um, the the education's a little different in that they get some manipulative musculoskeletal training that MDs don't get. I never got it, but I've turned into a DO fanboy. I mean, they can they can twist your arm up funny and count to thirty and untwist it, and the pain is freaking gone. I mean, it's crazy. Um, so, and then I've got students who get into orthopedics and. And never had a plastic surgery. Um, the other job that I've got is career counselor now. Uh, I've interacted with virtually every medical specialist as a pathologist. And so I spend a lot of my time, in addition to the teaching, uh, doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, interactions with medical students, helping them with their residency match. So it's a really rewarding position. Then I get to come home to my wife of 42 years, and and I have three daughters and five grandsons, and so I, you know, I'm I am blessed beyond all possible imagining with the life I've had. And, and you listen to Twip. What could be better? I, I know, <laughs> well, exactly. And I won a book. That's right. I, it hadn't come yet, but you know, I don't know how what kind of backlog you guys have, but yeah, I um, join the club. Been, it should have been. I'll have I think to. There's uh, a lot, a lot of backlog there. I will, I will oh. make a note of it because. Uh, and should... and some of my students have mentioned that they listen to Twip, so it'll be it'll be fun to see if I get comments back from uh, from the students after this airs. Well, we are working on the eighth edition, so when uh, when it comes out, let us know. Maybe we'll get some books your way. Mm, are you be fun. and the students, perhaps? Maybe I'll even, yeah. you know, maybe we'll have to take a trip out there to hand deliver them. Uh, yeah, well, you know, if if you guys want to come out in the summer, I'll take you up to Troublesome Creek, uh, which is a little creek in the mountains full of brown trout um, that are not very smart, which is my favorite attribute in a <laughs> trout, by the way. So uh, I do not need the I do not need the challenge. Um, I'm perfectly okay catching dumb trout. So I was going to ask where, where. Yeah, where is Parker? <clears throat> Parker is adjacent to Denver Southeast. It's okay. a. It didn't used to okay. be. It used to be a small town, you know, 15 miles southeast of Denver. But now de with Denver's growth, it's it's a big metro area. So mm -hmm. Parker's in the southeast area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Daniel spent, used to be in Colorado for many years, right, Daniel? Yeah, 20 years of my life I was in Colorado. I was... Uh, oh, were in, you at CU? So I was at CU Boulder for a little bit. Then I was um, I was up in... Um, well, I was a ski bum in Aspen for a while. And then I was actually chief of medicine up at Poudre Valley in Fort Collins. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah I never get... I almost never go north for whatever reason. I went to college in Colorado Springs, uh, which is south of Denver. So Spend I traveled back and forth there a lot, there. but uh, you know, half of my high school went to Colorado State, which is in Fort Collins. Yeah. Um, so you, but I, you were born in in Seattle, right? Is that what you said? Right. How many years did yeah. you spend in Washington? Uh, less than two. All right. So that's because now you've got an accent from Colorado, basically, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay. Or no accent from Colorado. Well, you have a, um, you have a twangy thingy going. Yeah, you've got on an there. accent. You've got a Colorado accent. I'm picking it I up. I say Colorado, <laughs> and a lot of people say Colorado. Let's ask Christina. So, Do you think he speaks different from us, Christina? <laughs> um. You know, I couldn't tell the difference. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's you so just, fun. She's just being I am so sorry. This is <laughs> Yankee for City for me. face red, just, you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's these, different. Yeah. Me, Dixon. These guys Daniel. are all Yankees. Yeah, We're these Yankees. guys are all Yankees, I can tell. Now, <laughs> my wait wife, a minute there, yeah, young. Yeah, my wife is on, from, my wife's from North Carolina. Um and uh, so I've I've learned that there are multiple Southern accents. There's not just a sure, Southern sure. accent. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah. but there are Northeastern accents, and and there's Midwestern, and and you know on and on. No, so well, we have, it's look, just I have some a New Jersey do. accent, okay, which is different mm -hmm. from a New York accent. And within New York, yep. you have Brooklyn, you have Queens, you have Staten Island. They're all different accents. It's amazing. 
Yeah. yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. <clears throat> so you'd never guess, but I was born in New Orleans. Oh, really? I spent one year. I only spent one year in New Orleans. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but if you asked me, I could do a real nice Southern <laughs> accent for you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I could put one on. Mine is not real nice, but but I can <laughs> kind of fake it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, James. So, Jim, uh, we have a paper now from Christina. Indeed. It's all yours. Yes. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, I, um, I suppose we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about something quite different. So, <clears throat> actually, I've chosen an opinion piece from a journal that I do rather like. Um, it, it doesn't really publish primary research, but it does really publish really very good um, review papers and opinion pieces. And they have a parasite of the month. Sometimes they also publish a vector of the month. So, I always look through it. And at that one, um, that really caught my eye. Um, so... Um, this is the title of the paper is Parasites and Childhood Stunting A Mechanistic Interplay with Nutrition, Anemia, Gut Health Microbiota and Epigenetics and um, it's in trends in parasitology it's open access as far as I can tell so um, listeners who would like to have a look at the paper can do that the authors are um, Gebain, Ramstein, Webster and Webster, I thought there were three, I thought there were four, hold on, my notes, <clears throat> my notes are incorrect, no, no, there are, there are three authors, sorry, so Gabain, Ramstein and Webster, and um, they're all, um, so London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, um, University of Aberdeen, and I'm trying to scroll to the affiliation for the last one, if I can just find it. Um, so the Royal Veterinary um, uh, University of London. So, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so you can have a look at that. So I'm quite interested in childhood stunting because, you know, I mean, it's something that maybe we don't hear so much in, in, in our parts of the world. But actually, there will be Probably, there's probably also a problem of stunting in the UK because it is associated with, with poor nutrition in, in the first years of life. So I, I'm kind of interested in that. So and um, it's about 150 million children under five years old that are affected by stunting. And actually, if you then kind of count up the total number of under five, so that makes it about 20% of all children under five. So that's a large, large number of, um, of children that are affected one way or the other by stunting. And actually what I didn't know, which is really quite interesting, is that in the absence of disease and when kind of maternal nutrition and postnatal nutrition are met, um, children all over the world, they grow at a remarkably similar rate during the first few years of life and that really regardless of where they are. So I think that is really, I, I thought, I mean, it's a side point, but I thought that was really quite interesting. So stunt, stunting is low height for H. Um, and that's really when we, you know, we have international standard tables for child development. So when you compare it to that, <clears throat> there's also another form of malnutrition that's wasting, and that um, um, that is different from stunting here. So what we're talking about stunting, so a prolonged kind of chronic malnutrition, really. So. It, Stunting refers to reduced physical growth, um, but it can also lead to cognitive, cognitive impairment. But this is not really, I think this is not really the context of the paper. And, and um, <clears throat> so that paper really refers to the WHO definition of, um, you know, reduced growth when compared to the international standard tables. And actually... <laughs> The first two years of life, they're really important for optimal growth. And if, if a child is not nourished properly during that time, stunting is largely irreversible from the age of two. So I think just from that point of view, I think it's really an important topic. And stunting affects many body systems, including the immune system. Um, so children can be more susceptible to inf infection. And also what I did not know before reading that paper is that also... 
stunting during childhood is a risk factor for rapid weight gain in adulthood, mm. which then potentially increases the risk of other diseases, um, diseases related to obesity later in life. So um, I, I didn't know that. So most stunting occurs <clears throat> Um, either in utero or as a result of pure nourishment um, later on. So, you know, for example, when, when the pregnant individual isn't, fe isn't eating properly or doesn't have access to adequate nutrition, that affects um, the, the, the growth of the developing baby. And also, obviously, having pure nutrition in the woman, that can also affect breastfeeding. And it is really a poverty-related condition. Um, and I think I already said that um, stunting is also associated with reduced neurocognitive development. And that can obviously affect children um, later when they do it, how, how well they do at school or maybe how, what, what they can attain in their adult life. It's a global health priority um, and the World Health Assembly has aimed to reduce stunting by 40% between 2010 and 2025, but we're nowhere near that. So I think the number is around, it's less than 30%. So, so where do you, you know, after talking all about stunting, like really where, where do parasites fit in? And so, so the paper starts by describing that there is a clear geographical overlap between communities suffering from high burdens of parasitic diseases and high rates of childhood stunting. And it has been proposed that the persistent and recurring parasitic infections play a role in that. And there are many different mechanistic pathways that could explain how parasites contribute to childhood stunting. And some of these are discussed in that opinion piece. And actually, if, if you do have the paper open, I think the figure one is a really quite nice illustration of those potential mechanistic pathways. However, I think what I'd like to mention is that the authors do not aim to answer if parasites cause stunting or how the contribution of parasites to stunting can be quantified. They just want to kind of look at how parasites could contribute to stunting. So, um, so in this first figure, if you have it open, if not, I'll give you the list. So we have a, a list that includes appetite suppression and undernutrition caused by parasites, diarrhea, environmental enteric dysfunction, perturbed gut microbiomes, systemic inflammation and chronic immune activation, anemia, and finally epigenetic signatures as contributing mechanistic pathways that could lead to childhood stunting. I think you know, some of these pathways or potential pathways, some of them make more intuitive sense than others or intuitively make more sense than others. But I'll, I'll maybe just talk through them um, very quickly. So, <clears throat> for example, the first in the list, appetite suppression and undernutrition. So, if we imagine a child with a parasitic infection, they may be too ill to eat. I'm thinking of a child with severe malaria. They're not going to be eating. A child might also have less appetite because they are in discomfort, maybe with a tummy ache. Um, and also, there has been some literature that showed that um, some parasites can actually affect the hormonal control of appetite. Um, so, for example, there are studies that have demonstrated that in children with entamoeba histolytica, strongyloides, and giardia infections, they, 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 they have been found, or higher levels of leptin have been found when compared to children that are not infected, and leptin is a hormone that regulates hunger by providing the sensation of being full. So that, that would be something interesting to explore maybe at some other point. Then similarly, diarrhea, um, which can result from many parasitic infections that obviously can impair nutrient absorption and digestions, and also <coughs> increase the breakdown of nutrient reserves. Um, and change intestinal enzyme activity and damage the intestinal lining. So I think these kind of these two first two points make really make a lot of sense. Um, please be, feel free to interrupt me at any point because I'm just kind of following my stream of consciousness now. The diarrhea I mean, can be caused by many things, right? Like even, vi even yeah, viruses, yeah, obviously, I mean, right? Viruses, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So obviously some intestinal infection, Giardia and Cryptosporidium right. and all sorts of parasites. Food allergies. Food allergies, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So we're tying back to our case. So another interesting mechanism by which parasites contribute to stunting is that they can cause environmental enteric dysfunction. And this really means that the intestinal surface is altered and damaged such that nutrient absorption is affected and also that the barrier function of the intestine is compromised. Mm. So some parasites, including Giardia, can affect the surface of the intestines, uh, so causing atrophy of the villi. And that means that important enzymes in the brush border of the, end times, um, of the intestines may be reduced. For example, nutrient transporters or other enzymes that break down nutrients. And that obviously then limits absorption and digestion, which can lead to stunting. Christina? And, <laughs> yeah. There is an association, at least in this country, between Giardia infection and lactose intolerance also. Um, mm. I've run into that a few times, in, including in myself. Um, and uh, I had Giardia and then became permanently lactose intolerant. So uh, that mm. in, a, in a part of the world where milk is a huge part of decent nutrition for the kids, um, I had never thought of Giardia plus a milk-based culture, but I had a good friend who worked with the Gabra tribe for a while in Kenya, and he said he never saw them eat a plant, that their major source of nutrition was camel's milk, camel yogurt, and the occasional stew made out of a camel or goat that had outlived its uh, <laughs> useful um, life. And... Uh, so, so there are places in the world where milk is crucial as a nu as a nutrient. Mm. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, I think well, that all makes perfect sense. Actually, the, the evidence of the mechanisms or the mechanistic pathway in people is maybe still lacking, but we do have some. Oh, my my my, uh, my cat just jumped on my screen and made my <laughs> document disappear. I've been having an argument with her all evening. She's been trying to drink my water and she's been jumping on my keyboard. I could I could jump I, in. I I, I'll jump in for a moment <laughs> while you reset. Um, <laughs> no, I've I've got it again, okay. so that's all right. But yeah, please do jump. Yeah, in. I was you know I mean a couple couple of comments you know. I, I, you know, and I think it's this connection. Like, you, you know, I'm not so worried that people in the world might be short, right? But what I am really worried about stunting is this correlation with cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. right? So the the low height for age actually correlates um, in many ways with with cognitive impairment, which even when a child um, can accelerate, can actually correct for the uh, the lack of height, a lot of that early impact on cognitive impairment mm. can be can be permanent, right? So there, there are, yeah. I hate to say this, but there's people in the world who are like, oh, you shouldn't be getting rid of all those parasites. We've evolved with them. They're really important. Um, and, and I know um, the other side of that is, okay, yeah, when we get rid of them, we're going to increase people's risk of one day having diabetes, one day having heart disease, one day living long enough to have those, you know, those first world problems. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just sort of, I think there's a lot here about how important it is during the first few years of life not to have this stunting both yep. physically and cognitively. Um, and it is, it is interesting. And I, I think there's sort of, you know, back to first world problems, this concept that having parasites may have a number of different mechanisms for triggering this, right? So they, they talk about how um, children infected with entamoeba, with strongyloides, with Giardia actually have these elevated levels of leptin. And leptin is mm. like the, uh, it's like the free um, ozempic, right? It, it makes you feel yeah, full. Yeah. But unfortunately, it makes you feel full when you're not. Um, and so, you know, part of our first world problem might be is that we now are all leptin deficient, but boy, what a wonderful thing to be leptin deficient and worried about problems in your 60s, 70s, and 80s when you've had really good cognitive development and can problem solve and can, you know, fight these challenges. But um, though they don't spend as much time as, you know, us parent, parasite aficionados would like, um, this is a huge problem. 
um, this stunting. Oh, absolutely, you know. yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's a, and that's one, one reason why I'm really interested. There's Sorry, another... Jim. Yeah, there's another issue that that comes up. It's not only poverty, and it's not a, like a quantitative thing. There's also a qualitative issue to the diet. Uh, for example, a pure uh, plant-based diet for a two-year-old who's trying to grow their brain is probably not going to work because they don't get enough omega-3 fats to grow mm -hmm. their brain. And um, so that's something that, you know, can you get omega threes from from flax seeds? Yes, but most people don't have the enzymes to extend them into DHA and EPA, which you need for your brain. So, um, it's partly the type of diet. Um, there is a gal I know I know of named Diana Rogers, who's a nutritionist, and she is setting up a global health foundation to get more animal-based products into young kids so that they actually grow properly in those first two years of life. Um, this is counter to the prevailing uh, culture right now in where we're going plant-based, plant-based, plant-based everywhere. But humans are omnivores. And, uh, you know... <sighs> Just look at the nutritional profile of what a human needs to eat and look for where are you going to get choline and B12 from plant sources. You know, it's it's a problem. I, I think people need to step back a little bit. I used to joke with the students that the Lone Star Tick was developed in the <laughs> secret vegan laboratories of Switzerland um, to and released into the United States to cut down on meat consumption. But... But but really, I mean, Daniel, didn't you, don't aren't you a aren't you a rancher? You know, I mean, I I, I own cattle, and actually, it is interesting. Yeah. I I was thinking about as we were discussing that case. Um, you know, for a lot of people, maybe it would be cheaper to just let a lone star tick um, give them a, a bite on the leg, and then they're going to cut all the cheese and the whole milk and the 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 ribeyes out of their diet. <laughs> Well, it's even debatable because I know a guy who's six foot four, orthopedic surgeon, vigorous beyond all imagining, and his sole diet is meat, mm. um, and he has normal uh, lipids on it in his heart. So it's not it's not as simple as nutritional quote science, if there is such a thing as nutritional science has been telling us <laughs> for the past, because it's, it's so hard to do. It's yeah. impossible to do nutritional science. Uh, I, I'm joking, but, but I'm glad I don't try to do it. <laughs> Anyway, let me let, let me let me just circle back to parasites just for a few more minutes. So I, 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 we, we like to kind of hear about how parasites can do that. So, for example, I'm, I'm still kind of talking about uh, um, the dysfunction, the intestinal enteric dysfunction. So, for example, Entamoeba histolytica produces proteases that can lose tight junctions between the epithelial cells in the gut. So, you know, making we're uh, breaking the barrier both directions, I suppose. Uh, and then parasites can cause damage by attaching to epithelial cells or even invading them. And then it can induce cell death. And, um, and then also maybe what we need to remember also is that a child that is already undernourished and also infected with parasites may maybe not be able to repair the damage as efficiently as a well-nourished child. And that's just going to further exacerbate the problem. And, you know, ultimately the goal if the gut is more permeable, permeable, this can also result in the presence of harmful microbes and lead to inflammation. Um, so, um, but I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to actually better understand the relationship between parasite intestinal integrity and stunting. And then. Another one on the list that the authors put up is the microbiome. Mm. And I, I really find the microbiome really interesting and how it affects health really fascinating. Even more so after recently participating in a study that analyzed my own microbiome. But I, shall, I will not overshare, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not quite clear that a healthy gut microbiome really plays a, an important or large part in the health of, of people. I suppose animals as well, and many different diseases in people have been linked 
um, to the composition of the microbiome. And then, you know, for example, inflammatory bowel disease, possibly some metabolic diseases, uh, obesity, diabetes, allergies, and also neurodevelopmental conditions. I mean, obviously, we, we don't really have time to look at the strength of the evidence of these links. But, you know, if you do a quick Google Scholar or PubMed search, you'll probably find a lot of really interesting literature. So it has been shown that children presenting with stunting have a less developed microbiome. Um, so, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about the directionality of cause and effect. So there's probably a lot of in there that we need to untangle. So we don't have information about when microbiome data was collected, for example, during a time of chronic malnutrition or maybe at a later point in life. And it's also not clear how parasites can affect the microbiome, mm. as there are not many studies really that look at it, into it. But I did follow through a reference and found a study in Thailand that has shown a difference in abundance of three microbiome bacterial species between children with Helminth infection when compared to children that were not infected with Helminth infection. So there's probably, I mean, it was a small study with a small number of children and they, they, they couldn't, so the author in the study couldn't identify a significant association between the Helminth infection, the microbiome diversity and growth par par parameters, but there's definitely a lot of research still to be done there. Um, then let's move on to systemic inflammation. Um, so you know, the immune activation is costly in terms of energy expenditure and this probably diverts calories and nutrients away from growth. Um, that has been shown by association, um, for example, in a study in the Amazon region where children with increased antiparasitic immune response measured by total IgE have reduced growth. And I think they were talking about another study in infants in Malawi where it has been shown that cryptosporidium infection was indirectly associated with lower length for age through increased systemic inflammation and reduced plasma insulin growth factor one concentrations. And just for context, I had to look that up myself. So IGF-1 um, is a hormone that manages the effects of growth hormone in the body and together IGF-1 and growth hormone promote normal growth of bones and tissues. So again, you know, a lot to and a lot to explore, another topic for another twip maybe. Then they also list anemia. I think I'm getting closer to the end of the list that they are proposing. So anemia being one of them. So that's a common result of some parasitic infections. For example, hookworms can cause damage to blood vessels and they also consume a small amount of blood. Malaria causes anemia by destroying red blood cells and other mechanisms. And then um, inflammation caused by some other parasites can affect red blood cell production or iron absorption. And actually, anemia and stunting are often presenting together, but it is not easy to establish if, if you know, what, what the causal correlation is. So, um, let me see. I've got an example here from embryonic mice. It has been shown that hypoxia, so low oxygen, contributes to growth retardation by interference with the IGF system that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, that would be a potential mechanism to explore. Um, for malaria, there is, there is evidence that infection increases the risk of stunting, but it's not entirely clear how. And obviously, maternal anemia can also play a role during the time when infants are exclusively breastfed. And then finally, and that's where I'm on a lot more thin ice, the authors also consider epigenetic changes that can contribute to stunting. Um, so, um, yeah, so I... I, I yeah, I, I think there's, I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting aspect to maybe look at and how that could potentially be tied in with parasitic infection. Um, but I didn't really spend all that much time on that because I'm, I'm not very familiar with epigenetic changes. So I thought I'd just leave that maybe for another twip. And then the authors really conclude that you know, with many outstanding questions, for example, which parasites are most likely to contribute to stunting? How could, how could this 
prioritize future studies or if there's a period of child development that is particularly vulnerable, stunting influence by parasites. So that, there's a really a lot to look at still and um, that's even without looking at maternal parasitic infection that could also contribute to um, you know, um, reduce growth in fetal development. So, uh, I don't know, I just thought it was really interesting because it opens up many doors for future papers that we could maybe look at because stunting is such an important topic that we haven't really covered all that much mm. on TWIP yet. So, I think that would be um, good for the Christina, future. The, and that, that's me. What's the global distribution? I presume, you know, and it's different in different countries, right? Yes, so I think what I mentioned at the beginning is that um, um, it overlaps, so stunting overlaps geographically with areas where there is high burdens of parasitic infection. Mm -hmm. So I would assume, they didn't show a map. I think that, did they show a map? No, I, didn't, I don't think Correct so. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, there no, wasn't a map in no there. Map. Um, and, you know, I, I would assume that kind of correlates with maybe low and middle income countries right. more but but then there is stunting in our parts of the world as well, and possibly not related to parasitic infections. Mm -hmm. So it would probably be difficult to kind of pull pull the nuances apart. Yeah. But there is yeah. a correlation between high parasitic burden and large rates or high rates of stunting. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, in the, geographically, like in the U.S., there's a lot of poverty, and I'm sure that's associated with yeah. stunting as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely, yeah. All right. And, you know, poverty is also associated with high infections and yeah, yeah. poor nutrition. I mean, poverty is really the root cause of of so well, much. High, uh, poor health care, right? And then everything stems from Yeah, that. poor yeah. health care, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. And you. poor public health, which is probably more important initially mm -hmm. than even... With, uh, if you've got good water and, and good sanitation sure. systems and all that, that's, you know... Yeah, I'm a doc, but I'm I try to be humble and remember that those engineers beavering away on public health are probably doing a lot more good mm. for more people than I am. Yeah, greatest invention of humanity, the toilet in the sewer. Right, Dixon. He's muted. Yeah, that's okay. On purpose. <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Christina. You're yeah, welcome. thank you. That I hope was, you enjoyed that. That's a vitally important, and this is unto the seventh generation kind of stuff. This, this is the curse that keeps on giving and giving and giving, generation right. after generation. This is, yeah. Mm. yeah this is, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, one thing that I kind of came to mind when I was reading that, I was thinking, oh, this is all. Everything is just connected to. to to, to each other and it's just so complicated and I kind of thought oh it feels almost a bit like we are never going to solve that aren't we I kind of felt a bit um what, what Daunt, would be a word daunting kind of, daunting da yeah it's very daunting isn't <laughs> it and then but on the other hand you also wonder do we need to know all the details and I, I don't know it was just I just thought it was really it made me really think of that paper so um yeah um, Daniel, before we move to our next, our case, do you want to talk about the population of Nigeria? Uh, of course, one of my favorite <laughs> topics. Yes, so I've been adding these little, want to talk these about little it, corrections <laughs> into our podcast. So let me jump in with, uh, let me read the letter. To the esteemed Dr. Griffin, I am very much appreciative you're being careful with your language and with your facts. Thus, I assume that you would want to correct any inadvertent misstatement. I believe that I heard in TWIP 226, about 23 minutes in, a statement that the population of Nigeria is approaching a billion. This was such a startling thought that I did a small bit of checking to find that Nigeria is the most populous African country at about... 226 million persons, according to the Worldometer. I apologize for writing in just to criticize. There is much to praise and very little to criticize. However, it is the errors that require intervention in order to safeguard the value, integrity, and image of the work. As a testament to that value, I listen to every episode of every Microbe TV podcast, and this has enriched the lives of everyone around me as a beacon of sanity in a world of media madness. I am deeply grateful. 
I thought you would want to know and to have the opportunity to offer a correction. If you agree, and if I did not misunderstand what I heard, I didn't miss the actual point that Nigeria accounts for a large percentage of the malaria deaths in part by reason of its relatively high population. Bless you and your work. Sincerely yours, Lauren. And yes, Lauren, you are right on point. The, uh, the, the approaching a billion population in Nigeria is such that that will probably not occur for another 75 years. So, <laughs> okay. That's right. <laughs> but if, I, Daniel, but if you had said instead that India has now become the most densely populated country in the world, exceeding the population of China, you would have been uh, right. How many people, Dixon? <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to say it because I'm going to get a letter. Otherwise. Can I say over a billion? <laughs> over a billion. <laughs> I'm going to look at world meter and verify. It's over, I think it's about a billion and a half people. Uh, That's yeah. right. And I, and I think lot, I was also, I also yeah, got, 1. you know, we, yeah, we corrected this on, um, what was it, TWIV, that'll drop uh, Saturday morning, like well, yeah. well before this one drops. That uh, And Dr. Shamal, I don't know if you were aware of this, probably waiting to hear the results as our other TWIP listeners were about the outcome of the New Year's sailing regatta. So we have a, a bunch of lunatics here. And what we do is we drop sailboats in the water with a crane and we go out racing on New Year's Day and New Year's Eve in the frosty uh, waters. Um, and since it has a high enough salt content, it doesn't necessarily freeze. So if you can dodge the, uh, the icebergs, you can have a bit of competition. And uh, my cousin and I actually were victorious this year. Nice. Hey, congratulations. So a shout out to an, a regular TWIV listener, Peter Dates, my cousin, for helping me to accomplish that feat. After about 10 years of losing. <laughs> for me, he's actually won well, a not losing, times. but not winning. Yeah. You know, there will be lots of other people. Yeah, when you come in second, Christina, that's first place loser. So I've been losing. Right. right. Yeah. No one remembers who came in second. <laughs> you need to celebrate your own success. Second is pretty amazing too, but congratulations. So uh, population of India, 1.4 billion. Wow. Oh, my gosh. All right. I thought he... China was two. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> no. Yeah. It just seems that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, and, and I, last I looked, the U.S. was the third most populous country in the world. Mm, I think that's 330 right. Million? 330 I think, million? I think. I don't think so. Mm, who yeah. would be... Hmm. Anyway, who cares? Uh, but we're, <laughs> oh, I care. <laughs> we're up there. No, I had heard that we were, I've not fact-checked it, but I had heard that we were the third most populous country. It's a distant third after India and China. Yeah, I think the really discouraging part is to realize that over half of all of us live in cities, no matter where we live. And that's the one thing we have to learn how to do better. Otherwise, we're doomed we're, we're really doomed. If so we India, 1.428667663. And China, <laughs> one, China 1.425671352. And the U.S. at 339, approaching yeah. 340. So Vincent, million. as long as you've got the facts. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I stepped on your Go mind. Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> what is the land mass of India compared to that of China? <laughs> That I don't know. Two point nine seven three thousand compared to nine million three hundred and eighty eight compared to us right. nine million so, uh, forty seven. Okay. So much right denser. There. So people. India has per density far more people than live in China. And that's the way that's I, I've been to both places. Bangladesh and, uh, beats everyone though, because we're only at a oh, density yeah. of people per square kilometer forty one in India, but in Bangladesh right. it's one thousand three hundred twenty nine. Wow. wow. And worldometers is wow. pretty neat, Daniel. A lot of cool yeah, stuff. I'm, I'm reading this. Don't think I have all this memorized. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. And, and as, as Christina pointed out so aptly, the, um, the poverty rate in those places that we just mentioned, except for the United States, is quite high. And th that's the major problem. So if poverty sucks, as they would say, then what is the cure for poverty? Mm -hmm. And the answer is wealth. And that's the one thing that the human condition will never come to grips with, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I'm not professing communism or anything like this, but we don't share our wealth very well with anybody, including, you know, even among our family members. Yep. So I think that that's the biggest problem. Yep. All right. We are third. 
I looked it up. We are yeah, third. No, okay, third in okay, population okay. still. Still. Just ahead of Indonesia. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. This week in human geography. <laughs> <laughs> Twig. Right. And who, Twig. Knows, <laughs> who knows what's going to happen when they fix the immigration problem? So, so do we have another case for our next case? Christina, tell us about the case that you have here. Yeah, so this new case is contributed to me, um, was contrib- contributed to me by Eyal Leshem, who has actually presented a couple of cases for us before. So Eyal is a friend, but also a former student of mine. So it's really nice to have that kind of collaboration now ongoing. We often communicate on WhatsApp, which I really enjoy. So the case, let me read out my notes. So a 20-year-old female presented with intermittent fever up to 39.5 C. And I don't know how much that would be in Fahrenheit, but maybe someone can include that in the case description later. Headache and right, right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Her symptoms began 10 weeks after she returned from a two-month trip to Southeast Asia. She visited Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, Indonesia, and in brackets, Bali, and Sri Lanka, returning to Israel via Denmark. Prior to travel, she was vaccinated as recommended, and during the trip, she did not camp out, and she denies any exposures to fresh water, but did swim in hotel swimming pools in Thailand and in sea waters in Thailand and Indonesia. She denies consumption of raw meat, fish, and unpasteurized milk. During the trip, she ate local street food and salads and suffered a brief episode of diarrhea during her stay in Vietnam. Her physical examination was unremarkable. Initial laboratory workup revealed eosinophilia of 2,720 microliters uh, per microliter, um, which is 24%, mild amenia, mild thrombocytosis, alkaline phosphatase, gamma, and LDH were mildly elevated. And repeated thick and thin blood smears are negative for malaria. And toxocara serology is negative. So a contrast-enhanced abdominal CT showed several clustered hypodense lesions with ring enhancement in the liver, retrip- retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, mild ascites, and right pleural effusion. Due to continued symptoms and fever, abdominal CT is repeated two weeks later and revealed lesion progression and hypodense track marks. And that's all the information I have. Um, (laughs) I I don't think I can ask, I can answer questions, um, but, you know, I I could try, well... Yeah, no, that's, so that's, that's the information of, that we have. Lot. But I think that's enough. Yeah. That's a lot of information. Yeah, I think that's yeah. plenty. <laughs> yes. All right, uh, Jim, we look forward to your contribution there. <laughs> that is TWIP227. <laughs> you can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIP. If you want to participate in the clinical case, TWIP at microbe.tv. If you like what we're doing here, please support us. We could use your help. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Daniel Griffin is at... Columbia University Irving Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, and everyone be safe. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Good night, everybody. It was a lot of fun. Christina Nowell is at the University of Glasgow. Thank you, Christina. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed this evening. And by the way, I finally updated my website at the university, so we can maybe link link to that in the show notes as well. It's only taken me two years, but All right. getting there. Our guest today from Rocky Vista University, Jim Small. Thanks so much for joining us, Jim. Oh, it was a delight. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back in two weeks. It's parasitic. No, another TWIP is parasitic. Do it again. Oh. Another twip is parasitic. 